Hello, everyone, and hello, Beezer. Hello, Colette. So we're here to talk a little bit about where we've been and where we're going. And so the first and natural question is to Beezer, which is, tell me a little bit about how long you've been investing in Europe and what the ecosystem was like way back then. Well, I think if I start doing my math correctly, I first started looking at European venture in 2006. So a little over 12 years ago. Yep. And then I came here as Sapphire Ventures to launch our business of investing in early stage venture funds in 2012. So that was six years ago there. So collectively 12-ish and wow, have things changed. What would you, do you agree? I completely agree, but I happen to know that, you know, we have kind of the same opinion on uh, UK and Ireland and the Nordics have up and come, but I believe the first place you came with Sapphire was Berlin. Yes. Tell me why. So we launched the business of investing in venture funds in 2012, and we do it in US and Europe and Israel. And when we looked at Europe, we looked at exactly the ecosystem you're talking about. The UK has always been a center of activity in venture investing, so we got that. The Nordics are awesome, we came here too. But we wanted to go to Berlin because we heard things were changing there. And we wanted to understand what that looked like because change is always an interesting investment opportunity. And another important data point about Sapphire is that our money originates from SAP, the German software enterprise company, and we have a core belief that who your investor is matters. So we wanted to go to Germany and see the world that our LP saw, and we started investing in Berlin, but first we spent a number of weeks walking around and looking at it, and even that ecosystem, can we talk about yes. that? Way, and how way much back that's when changed? In, two, in 2012. Yeah. Yes, I mean, just in six years, right? So do you want to start? I mean, well, we're there. I, um, I mean, it was rocket internet. It was all about rocket internet back then, right? and, and the ecosystem they had created. Um, it was mostly e-commerce focused yep. as well. Um, which I thought a lot of people thought well, they were going to live and die by e-commerce, but instead they have not. I mean, now what it looks like. It's a really full range. So we've been investing in Germany now for six years, and we look at our underlying portfolio, and to your point, when we first got there, it was all selling things online in a pretty, yeah. pretty replete but very directed way. And now we have drones, we have crypto, we have enterprise software selling into other enterprise you have a whole range of activities, which again, six years is like nothing. It's a nothing. blink of the eye. It's nothing. And you could just, I know we're talking a lot about Berlin, but it's a really interesting microcosm to understand that what the past looked like is a good predicator for the future, but in no way limits the potential. And we believe that things for Europe in general are gonna continue to grow and expand, and that's just one small example, that's right? Exactly. And you have great examples. Can I ask you about Paris? Yes. So when I first got to Paris in 2002, um, I remember, and I'll never forget, there's a, there's a great university there called Polytechnique, uh, Polytechnique, one of the top universities, and I was speaking to two founders, um, this was about 2005, and um, talking to them about their business, and I, for some reason I said, so what do your parents think about this? Um, and they said, oh, we don't tell our parents that we're entrepreneurs. And, I, I don't think I even registered that. I, I was like, are you, are you kidding? No, because they explained to me that this was a point of shame in French culture. To be mm. an entrepreneur meant that you couldn't get a decent job as an investment banker or a consultant, again, back in 2004, 2005. And, um, and you know, I, I, think, I think today, um, well, actually, I don't think these same two entrepreneurs are shouting from the rooftop about their success. And I mean, what, what a change, you know? In, it's a huge in, change. In a decade plus. So it's a huge change, and it makes me think of two things that we've seen evolve in the past and are kind of interesting tells for where things might go in the future, is not just the change in the embracing of entrepreneurship in Europe in general, but what that means for the venture capitalists and the types of people that are venture capitalists yeah. and how that works, right? Because as you've seen entrepreneurs come up, you've seen entrepreneurs, and I'm teeing you up so you can tell your story, because you're a living example of this, and I'm just, you know, the peanut gallery. But you see entrepreneurs coming up, making successful businesses, generating financial stability, and then putting that money back into other entrepreneurs. Yep. And the, the reflection of what we've seen happen in the venture community is that when venture started 20, 15, 10 years ago, it was all bankers, yeah. which is logical, right? I mean, venture is a kind of financial, financial instrument. Yeah. 
But what you've seen over the last, really over the last five, but starting 10 years ago, was operators that were successful putting money in the ground as angels and then becoming experienced and becoming venture capitalists. And now I'm going to have you tell your story because you lived it and I'm just observing it. Well, first and foremost, I am the founder of a, of a PR firm. And when I started back in 2002, I left California and came to France with, basically sold my car, sold stocks, I sold everything I owned to start the company. And, um, you know, and, there, and when I came to France, I tried to use LinkedIn to network and to build, and, the, and it wasn't a thing. Um, for those of you who remember France back then, there was a networking uh, platform called Via Deo. In Germany, we had Zing, um, but networking really wasn't a thing. So I remember watching my bank account go down, 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 and, and I said, you know, if it hits 800 euros, I need to go home and live in my father's basement. And I came really close to that. Um, and it was really scary. And eventually, we got our first really big client. And that led on to getting Facebook as a client, et cetera. But what I realized is there was, there was no safety net back then, none. Um, and that's what a lot of our entrepreneurs faced. Uh, you know, it, it was really, it was actually horrifically scary. Well, if you fast forward to today, the um, embracing of risk and innovation is wildly different. And the amount of venture capital dollars available for all kinds of businesses, right, um, is wildly different. So I was, we were chatting backstage and I was sharing with Colette this fact that is referenced in the Atomico report, but I thought we'd pull out some data on it was a decade ago, the majority of funds were sub 50 million, which just means there's just not that much money to go into yeah. startups. Yeah. Now, in 2017, 60% of the venture funds raised were between 100 and 500 million, which just means a lot more. Yeah. And that's just the money that comes from LPs like ourselves that go into venture funds that then go into companies. There's actually a whole other huge pool of capital that skips the venture capitalists completely and comes in from strategics, from corporates, from ICOs, right, and all that goes into companies as well. So what you have today is a wildly different landscape than what you had 10 years ago for entrepreneurs. Different kinds of funds, different numbers of funds. Yep. I think going forward you'll see even more um, creativity in the kinds of financing vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, different yep. platforms will come up. You've got Entrepreneur First, yep. you have a Family in, yep. in France. Yep. I think all of these are hallmarks of people starting to play with the idea of not just let's innovate on the company side, but let's innovate on the financing yeah. side. Yeah. And in fact, um, you know, one thing that really struck me is the um, Balderton's Liquidity Fund, which was announced not too long ago. I mean, huge kudos to Laura and Daniel because that's brought a level of maturity to this ecosystem that's allowing liquidity. I think, if I remember correctly, one of the Balderton portfolio founders from Go Cardless actually used that fund to get some liquidity and then go and start a new company, Nested. This would not have been possible 10 years ago, even five years ago. So it's a hallmark of a, of a maturing ecosystem. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, though, about where we have been. So, um, and, and, you know, we were talking about sub, you know, 50 million funds. Wasn't Index's first fund 1996? Mm -hmm. I think it was 17, 20 17 million. million. Yeah. I and mean, if you think about that, it's kind of amazing. I mean, Index is a really incredible participant in the venture ecosystem here. And if, for those of you who aren't as familiar, there is an early stage fund, a growth fund, a life sciences fund. They originated in Europe. In, and have moved to the United States and opened up some offices there, which is pretty interesting, right? When you look at the evolution of firms and who goes from yeah. Europe to the United States and who from the United States comes here. Yeah. So, right? and there's been Excel, obviously, mm -hmm. 2001. Yeah, so 2000, 2001, when you had another big upswing in venture, you had folks like Excel and Benchmark and Greylock that started in the United States. You guys remember that? Like, <laughs> I, yeah. Not that long ago, <laughs> sort of, I guess. Kind of dating ourselves. <laughs> um, but they all came here and started, uh, put up offices in Europe. And the interesting thing is that two of those three have now gone independent and created their own brands and their own, their own businesses, right? So Greylock Europe Israel is now 83 North. And Benchmark Europe is now Balderton. Yep. Excel, as just saw Luciana on the last panel, is still Excel, yes. and that's great. More and than that, alive and kicking, like just kicking. Kicking. Yeah. Um, I think for me, and when I look at the venture ecosystem, I think that just speaks to the health of it. Yes. Because the fact that you can get more diversity in types of funds just tells you there's a really rich pool to pick from. And, and also, you were talking about this earlier, 
there are more operators who are now in, involved in the funds, right? It's not just investment bankers or um, you know, consultants. It's people who have actually run startups. And that's another sign of a maturing ecosystem and a really mm -hmm. healthy sign. You have people who've been in startups. I mean, it, you know, for example, um, again, I'm an LP, and I advise my funds on things as far-reaching as creating a healthy culture, because I've had to do it across three markets, in France, and Germany, and the UK. Um, I didn't, you know, before that kind of knowledge wasn't out there, it wasn't something they could tap into. So you see these operators now, um, true operators coming in and joining um, as, you know, maybe joining as associates, or maybe even starting as GPs. We see millennial funds now, mm -hmm. like BACT, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, you know, folks who have, who, you know, really just jumping in. Yes, you're seeing, um, well, it's really a great time to be an entrepreneur, honestly, so. in my opinion, hopefully, and in, in yours too, because the range of funds that are starting in the last five years five in years, Europe, yeah. if you think about it, you've got larger funds that are there for the growth stage, you've got funds that are thematic, Blue Yard in, in Berlin that's doing decentralization of software. You've got Point Nine that's focusing on SaaS and marketplaces. Felix in, in London that does the next generation digital life. Those are, again, just characteristics of a mature ecosystem. this just ecosystem. didn't exist in 2005, no. 2006. Full they stop. were just kind of generalist funds that weren't especially risk taking. I, you can speak better to that. As an entrepreneur in Europe, I didn't have yeah. that. I was yeah. not an entrepreneur, so I can't speak to that. But I can say when we study venture capital, I don't know if there is a rule of law so much, but there do seem to be some pretty repeatable evolutionary characteristics. Like what? And one of those seems to be when you, when an ecosystem starts, they tend to be generalist funds because that's what the ecosystem okay. needs, right? They tend to be smaller funds. They tend to be ex-bankers or consultants. And then as, as it matures and gets deeper, you see the funds specializing a bit. And there's always a role for the generalist fund, but you can have thematic ones. You can have ones focusing on frontier tech now which you have in Europe. You have all of these different kinds, which means if you're an entrepreneur, you have a great wealth of types of investors to pick from, yeah. right? Which is, is wonderful. You have a whole new angel ecosystem yes. that did not exist. Yeah. As an angel, do you wish to angel. talk about that? No, it is really interesting, but as we talk about kind of like what fueled the change in the ecosystem, and you're saying, well, you know, first of all, it's just a maturing ecosystem. Um, is there anything else that you like, have identified that you've said this is what fueled that, or maybe this is atypical about Europe? Well, I think I'm repeating something. I don't know how many folks listened to the Atomico report this morning, but they talked about the importance of having successful company stories, yes. right? It, it produces a significant number of wonderful things, the least of which is it shows as a lighthouse example that things are possible. And Europe has really had an amazing run the last few years of exits of companies that, of course, started eight or 10 years ago, but are now proving the point that it's possible, of course, to have a European started company be successful in Europe or be in Europe and move globally. And that draws in more investors. Yes. It draws in more entrepreneurs. It trains more professionals to then go and work in other startups. And it's that activity that makes the ecosystem so rich. So we are very bullish on the future of venture and entrepreneurship in Europe. You look at what's come before, and you can look at the tea leaves going forward and say that you've got a real extraordinary number of more experienced people than you ever had before who are seeing what's possible. For the first thing I did was turn around and invest when I started, like I just automatically turned around and invest in technology and in European technology on, on top of it. So yes. Mm -hmm. So then and you have more LPs coming in. That's true, right? Because as LPs, uh, in see individuals it. like individuals me and and more and institutions, institutions like because yeah. as the as the Atomico report was saying, the European venture capital is starting to deliver returns equivalent to the U.S. And if you're an investor, that's that's great news. Like why why would you not come and participate in that? And it. There, were, there was definitely a focus this morning on the pension funds in Europe, and there's certainly one source of capital, but you also have a number of other sources that can come into play, and that's seeing what's possible and will dictate future success. Speaking right. of the future, what can folks who are looking to fundraise, entrepreneurs or VCs, learn from the past, or maybe to put it in a different way, um, what should folks be looking for mm. when they're fundraising? And this is a... There are many answers, and I, ask, I think th this audience would like to hear them, so dig in. Well, as I said before, it, our core belief is that who your investor is matters, right? Where are you going to get money from, be it as an entrepreneur, as a venture capitalist? And this is a great market for that, because sometimes, you know, unfortunately, you don't have a choice, right? And that's, that's just reality. We don't always have a choice for where we can fundraise. But when you have a choice, 
be, be in choice, mm -hmm. right? And we believe that if you can choose, why would you not choose an investor that can bring strategic assets to your firm, right? To be a strategic asset of your company mm -hmm. and to deliver more than money because money's green and your money looks like my money, looks like your money, looks like your money. Mm -hmm. And what else can your investor yeah. do besides that? What is their, what's their orientation? How permanent is their capital? No, wait, that's an interesting one. Permanence, how, mm -hmm. are you gonna be there for me? Yep. What, it, what, how do you ask that question? Of oh, your investor. It's a great. Well, we always we ask these of our of our investors too. Um, sort of, what's your interest in this category? I'm going to use broad terms so people can flex it based on their situation. But you want to know from your investor why they're investing in your space. Mm -hmm. How long have they been investing in your space? Um, it's hard to predict the future, but you can certainly ask people what they've done in the past. So during downturns, how did they behave? Mm -hmm. Were they able to continue investing, or did they have to switch to some other form of capital, or just what, pull and it back in? And if they refused, I mean, so I, one thing I, I, we're imploring the audience, whether you're an entrepreneur or a venture capitalist, is ask the questions. These are not off limits. You're, you, you will not put off a good investor by asking these questions. In fact, you will attract, the, and an, any smart investor will really appreciate that you're asking these very difficult questions. And we should answer them for you, quite frankly. So don't be afraid. Um, and you should be asking, again, mm -hmm. I, I like the one you did bring up, which is, you can't ask them, you're gonna get one story in a downturn, how were you? Oh, we were great to all of our companies or, or all of our portfolio. But you need to actually do your due diligence and find out how they really were. Uh, you know, in a bad, so that means not asking them, asking around, look at their past portfolio, find companies who have failed, find entrepreneurs who have failed with these investors um, and dig out what they really were like. What was like, things do go bad. They can go bad badly or they can go bad as well as they possibly can. It's your job to find out. Agreed. Um, other aspects that we've looked for both when we invest or when we work with other folks is, What's their thought leadership? What's their perspective on the market? If someone's gonna come and invest in your company, my, my hope is that you're gonna use them as some sort of advisor and you'll be in contact with them and have conversations and wouldn't you wanna pick somebody that you think brings an interesting mindset that might be complementary but maybe slightly different from your own, mm -hmm. right? There's also a whole new, and you see this in venture capital writ large, a bringing of additional business services to the table. So it's not just, yeah. here's my checkbook, right? Yeah. But let me help you. And you see many venture firms doing this. You see fewer LPs, not many are set up to do it, but you're seeing more and more folks do this where, can I make a business introduction? Can I help you with recruiting? Can Sales. I... Yeah. Sales, yeah. right? Can I connect you with other investors? These are all things that, given the depth of the investing ecosystem today, is possible, which it just wasn't as viable 10 years ago. It's just one hadn't seen it done, and then as people started to do it, you realized you could up and down the stack was possible. And do you see consistently, let's go specifically back to GPs and venture capital funds, are there any mistakes that they're making in choosing their LPs that you would, again, if you could, advise them? I think the questions you brought up are really good ones, which is you know, understand who you're taking money from um, and then be in choice, right? And it's, it, it, it's hard to speak what everybody wants. We get asked, let me make it personal. What do you get asked? Yeah. We get asked a range of questions. We get asked, you know, where does your money come from? How do you know it's good? Uh, good. How, how, do you, like, how do you know you're going to have it for the future, right? Because okay. our belief is if we're investing in a, in a venture firm, we should be there for you for as long as you as long as you need capital, we should be able to look to the future and see what our capital looks like too, versus saying, oh no, I have no more money after two years. Like, that's, that's less good. Um, we also get asked, what do you do besides bringing capital to the table? We get asked that, like what other services? And what services? do you bring? Uh, we have- Sapphire in particular. Sapphire in particular has developed what we call portfolio growth, which is a range of services that we bring to bear for our VCs and underlying companies that include the business development the recruiting and the talent, because um, we believe that it's important and we have that as a benefit from our LP. Mm -hmm. um, we get asked who, who we've invested in when, and when times have been tough, how do you stand up? And to your point, sometimes you have to have tough conversations. Um, people want to talk to the folks that we've invested in and that's all, that's all good. We think all that's important. Have you ever been put off by somebody asking these questions? What, what's your how do Our you perspective, feel no, we feel the same way what you're talking about, which is if we're going to ask questions, you should be able to ask questions too. Yeah. 
and, and I've never, it's never been an issue. And I, and I cut you off and I didn't mean to. What else do you get asked? Is there any other pertinent questions that you get asked? Or is there anything that you don't get asked that you think people should be asking? Uh, or is there something that folks you know are focusing on that they shouldn't be because well, it doesn't matter? It, it's a, there's a range of questions and what I have found is that everybody's different. And so who we are is the same, right? It's an abs it's, we just are who we are, but what people will come for and look from us varies, which actually speaks more about the fact that you as someone who's fundraising should think about what you need. Mm -hmm. And you might be able to find different institutions that provide that, or maybe the same institution, right? Some folks come to us for portfolio growth. Some folks come to us for our thought leadership. Some folks come for different reasons, and we're no different. We're the, we have the same array of capabilities, but people want different aspects, so they'll pull on different parts. Similarly, I suspect when folks come to fundraise from you. Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, in fact, I'm super clear that if you're only coming to me for money, this probably isn't a fit um, because it just, I mean, there's a lot more that I can do. And in fact, you might, I'm, I'm a very active LP. Would never have guessed. <laughs> Some people might say a little overactive. I'm, I'm, you know, I'll ask questions. I'm, I am up on one of my funds very much because I don't think they have enough diversity. Mm. I am really up on them. Um, and, but I also get into their portfolio, when they, when they bring me in, they'll bring me in across their portfolio and I'll help solve that question or answer that or figure out that question. And I, I, I swore I would be an active LP and it's probably more valuable, I think, than the money I bring to the table. I would really hope so, actually. Excellent. You know, it's interesting. We do get told by some folks they just want someone to show up with money. And they don't want me. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want you. I am the last person they want to see. So are there, I'm going to push you on one question because you didn't answer it and you may not want to. But are there any questions that people ask you that you feel are not relevant or that you'd be like, you know, or anything that they're looking for in an LP that you're like, no, really, you need to change your, your thinking on this one? Well, I think a lot of folks believe that capital is forever. And the reality is that's never true. So you should always understand from your LP when in times things have changed or under what function or your, your VC, right? If there's a protracted downturn, everyone's affected. It's going to be hurt. Right? If, and that's just true. And if there is, you know, there's different, different business models, be it a pension fund or a university or a fund of funds or a family office, everybody has different business models. So just understand them. And I think that's all we have time for. Beezer, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have a chat with for you. And thank you. Mm -hmm.